Hi, I'm Jackson Crawford. I'm an Old Norse specialist, previously teaching at several universities and now presenting on Old Norse language myth, etc. on my YouTube channel, supported by my general community of Patreon donors, uh, for anyone who might be interested in these subjects. Today, what I want to give you is a quick overview and orientation to the Gothic language, which is a close relative of Old Norse, although preserved in bulk form earlier than Old Norse is. So in a lot of ways, it preserves what could be considered a uh, kind of a side look at a more archaic form of Old Norse, or indeed of English. Now, as far as how the family tree looks, we can reconstruct an ancestor language for most languages of Europe, Northern India, and some areas in between called Proto-Indo-European. From that branch out many different subfamilies of languages, one of which is the Germanic languages, which is not called that because it, these languages are all from German. Uh, they include German though. The Germanic languages include Gothic, the earliest of the Germanic languages attested in uh, long texts. Now, Gothic is not necessarily the earliest language attested, period. The earliest confirmed writing that we have in a Germanic language is actually in runes from around 8160, and those come from Vimosa, Denmark. So we could really call that Proto-Norse rather than something like Gothic, or you could even maybe call it Proto-Germanic because maybe Proto-Germanic hadn't quite broken up by then. But Gothic is important because it is actually preserved in lengthy texts from earlier than any other Germanic language. So we have texts in Proto-Norse or even Proto-English from the first few centuries AD, but they tend to be very short runic inscriptions of the kind of just labels, or someone's name, or just a brief memorial formula for someone who has passed on, something of that kind. With Gothic, we're in a better position because there's actually a Bible translation. Now, we don't have the entire Bible left to us today, but we have most of the New Testament and a little bit of the Old Testament. That's still a lot, considering how early that we have it from. So, the Gothic language has developed since Proto-Germanic, right? But it's a few centuries closer to Proto-Germanic than something like uh, most of our Old Norse texts. Because the Bible translation that we have was done, or at least commissioned, by a bishop, Wulfila, in the mid-300s. You might also sometimes see his name in the, uh, the Greekized form, Ulfilas. But actually, if you look at his name in Gothic, Wulfila, you might notice that it bears a small resemblance to the name of a particular Hunnish leader in Eastern Europe at about the same time, Attila. Now, the Huns did not speak Gothic, but we really don't have much Hunnish left to us, and the Huns employed so many Gothic mercenaries that the Greeks and Romans came to know the leader of the Huns under the name that the Goths called him, which was Attila. Now, notice Attila, Wolfila, they both ended at Ila, right? Ila is a diminutive suffix in Gothic. It means like the little one, like Spanish Cito. So Attila is little daddy. Atta is the affectionate way of saying like dad instead of the more formal father in, in Gothic. So he's little dad and Wolfila is little wolf, right? Wolf's is wolf. Ila means little. So he's, he's little wolf. He's, he's wolficito, lupicito, <laughs> something like that. Um, apparently this was fairly common in Gothic names. So his translation of the New Testament, well, it was probably the entire Bible, but we really have mostly just the New Testament to work with, is in the mid-300s. Most of our Old Norse texts are from the mid-1200s, right? Not that an ancestor of Old Norse wasn't spoken in the mid-300s, but we just don't have it well documented back then. So Gothic hasn't undergone many of the sound changes that distinguish Old Norse or, or Old English later on. As we can see, if we take a look at a quick uh, quotation from John 10 in, uh, in Gothic. Now everybody gives you the Lord's Prayer, so I want to give you something different. 
This will be John uh, 10, starting at, at verse 11. Pronunciation of Gothic, a little uncertain, definitely more uncertain than with Old Norse. With Old Norse, we actually have uh, linguistic writing, uh, such as the first grammatical treatise from the 1100s. We have such complicated poetry that we can figure out what rhymes with what. With Gothic, we're not as informed, so we can't always say exactly what something sounded like, especially vowels. Uh, an example problem is that short E is written with the two letters AI, but so is the diphthong AI. Uh, short O is written with the diphthong AU, but so is the diphthong AU. We don't know if the pronunciation of those uh, had actually fallen together, right? So is it like sometimes AI represents eh and sometimes it represents I, or do they both fall together into eh? We don't really know. Um, so that's that's a little bit of a problem. So this is pretty speculative. Don't don't uh, don't get too upset about some particular you know pronunciation thing. Ik em herdis goths, herdis sa gotha sawalasina lagiat for lamba. If asnis ya sai nist herdis, thize ni sin lamba suesa. Gasachwith wolf quemandan ya belithith tham lambam, ya thliuhith, ya sa wolfs fra wilwith tho ya distahith tho lamba. Ith sa asnis af thliuhith, unte asnis ist ya nikar ist inathize lambe. Ik im herdis sa gotha ya kan mina ya kunun mik tho mina. Swaswe kan mik ata ya ik kan atan ya sawala mina lagya for tho lamba. Ya anthara lamba ech tho i ni sin this awistris. Ya tho skal brengan ya stibnos minazos hausiand. Ya werthand an awethi ants herdis. Now, if you've encountered Old Norse, this doesn't look too familiar at first glance. And it still actually looks more familiar than it would in Gothic manuscripts because I have transliterated the Gothic alphabet into the Roman alphabet that we use in English and Old Norse uh, here for this presentation. Give me a quick moment to insert a word from my sponsor and I'll come back and tell you a little bit about how exactly this is so different from and yet so similar to Old Norse. So most of our Old Norse literature is written in the Roman alphabet, the same alphabet English is written in today, except with some additional letters to represent sounds uh, that weren't known in medieval Latin. The Gothic language is, however, written in, with the exception of a few inscriptions and runes, an alphabet that is derived from the Greek alphabet. And because of the time that Wolfila was, was working with this alphabet, he borrows some of the spelling conventions of uh, what we can really call early Byzantine Greek. These include writing the E sound with the digraph EI, right, which is pretty different uh, from what that represents in any Germanic language today. So we have to kind of uh, look past how differently things are spelled, even beyond the difference in alphabet. But if we do that, if we convert the text on the screen to the Roman alphabet as Old Norse is spelled and spell Gothic that way, you can much more quickly see the relationship, right? So, for example, you see the EIs become just long I's. You see the length marks in familiar places that you would put there if you were spelling it like Old Norse. You see the false diphthongs go away. You see the letter ed uh, rather than the D that people typically transliterate the Gothic letter with. And that does uh, bring it one step closer in familiarity. But another thing that's different between Gothic uh, 900 years earlier and the Old Norse that we're familiar with from the Eddas and Sagas is that Gothic hasn't undergone the vowel mutation phenomena or umlaut that Old Norse has. Right, so where 
unstressed vowels have mutated the sound of stressed vowels that precede them in words in Old Norse and then disappeared, we still have the full unstressed vowel in Gothic and the stressed vowel isn't mutated by the disappeared unstressed vowel. This can be seen most clearly in this passage in forms of the verb uh, to lay, lay down. So for example, you get Gothic lagieth, which is cognate with Old Norse leger, for that matter with Old English leith, where in Old Norse and Old English, you can see that the A in the root has been mutated, umlauted, to an E, but that hasn't happened in Gothic. But the unstressed vowel that does the mutation, the I, is still there in Gothic, but it's dropped out in Old Norse and Old English. Same thing with the J in lagia, that would be Old Norse leg, Old English lege, where the J has performed the mutation, the same mutation that the I performs in the A into an E in Old Norse and Old English, but the J is no longer there in Old Norse uh, and is sort of residually there in the pronunciation of the Old English form, but that's not really the subject of this discussion. Uh, same way, look at Halcyond, which is cognate with Old Norse hyra, to hear. There, we've got an S that hasn't mutated into an R. This is due to a complicated rule called Werner's Law, where the S of Proto-Indo-European if it were followed by a stressed syllable or accented syllable anyway in Proto-Germanic before the shift of all stress to the first syllable in Germanic languages, then the S will become a Z. Now in Gothic, those, those, those generated Zs uh, revert to Ss usually by analogy, but in Old Norse, those Zs become Rs, as they do in English, right? So Halcyon, is cognate with Old Norse hyra in English here, even though it doesn't really look like it at first glance because you've got both the um, mutation of a S through Z into R in Old Norse and English, and you've also got the umlaut or vowel mutation phenomenon where that J has mutated the diphthong au into a front vowel u in Old Norse, e in Modern English. So there's many, many other things um, that will distinguish the, uh, the Gothic language in the 300s from Old Norse in the 1200s. Some of that is archaism that would have been common to both. Um, you know, so these, these fuller verb paradigms where you distinguish second person from third person singular in the verb, that's gone in Old Norse in the 1200s. It was there in Old Norse in the 300s. We can tell from runic inscriptions. We just don't have very, very many runic inscriptions in Proto-Norse at that time. And then there's some some distinct changes in Gothic, for example, FL becomes thorn L, right? Fla becomes thla in Gothic. So the thliuhith in John 10, 12, uh, that's flees. Uh, that would be in Old Norse, I suppose, fleur. So Old Norse actually keeps the FL that's been turned into a thorn L in Gothic. And then we have some straight up vocabulary differences. You know, this laborer word asnis in Gothic that's not found in Old Norse. Uh, the word for and actually defers. Uh, Gothic has yah, uh, apparently borrowed either from Gothic or an early stage of, of Norse or late stage of Proto-Germanic into Finnish. Uh, whereas Old Norse has ok from an old word for also, and English has uh, and, which is related to uh, the, the n word in Old Norse, like, which is more of a contrastive and or but in Old Norse. So there's some vocabulary differences. There's some sound change differences. Um, some consonant change differences. Uh, so for example, in Old Norse, anywhere that you had one time a W before a U or an O, that W has disappeared. So notice that, of course, the bishop who translated the Bible into Gothic, or had it translated, we don't really know, uh, his name has the word wolf in it, right? Wolfs in Gothic, or wolf in English, but that's ulver in Old Norse where you see that old S go through Z to R in Old Norse, but also W drops out before U. It's the same reason why the God is Woden in Old English, but Odin in Old Norse, and presumably in Gothic, something like Wothans. In fact, we can be pretty sure about that. So, Gothic is a valuable window into an earlier stage of the Germanic languages not because it's a direct ancestor of something like Old Norse or Old English, but because it is a great aunt 
right, that's from the same generation as an earlier stage of Old Norse Ruled English, and thus gives us a sense of what the, that generation of those languages looked like without being their exact ancestor. But it's not a great literary source for the early Germanic languages because, of course, what we've got are translations, right? We have a translation of the Bible, we have some commentaries in the Bible and the Skirenes, and a couple little other things that barely rate mentioning, a couple very small runic inscriptions. So we don't really have original Gothic literature the same way as we have cool original Old Norse and Old English literature. But it is still very valuable from a philological point of view, especially when you consider, again, that it's kind of an icebox of an earlier generation of uh, a group of languages to which Old Norse and English ultimately also belong. Well, for beautiful Colorado, let me wish you all the best.